well. It's that time in the service where one little word becomes operative. It's called sermon. You see it in the bulletin. And as those of you who have been followers of Jesus know that sermons are necessary to give preachers a job. <laughs> that's one reason. But perhaps a more important reason is that you and I are nourished by the word of God given to the people of God. We are nourished by the word of God given to the people of God. I'm going to try to fulfill that obligation today. Now, it's been a long time since I preached the sermon. And I told someone just before the congregation filed in that, uh, you know, you, you get a little rusty on what the right hand is supposed to do while the left hand is doing this over here. So if you see something that seems to you to be out of order, don't worry. God makes up the difference. Amen? Amen. I'm going to ask you to take your Bibles and turn to Paul's letter to the Galatian Christians. It's an interesting letter, this letter to the Galatians, because Paul begins it in a very stern way. He looks out at the people and he says, Oh, foolish Galatians. Guess what? That's not a way that is going to enable you to win friends and influence people. Especially when you know that there are people back in Galatia who are taking notes, looking for every little opportunity given to them to show where this Paul is not the hotshot apostle that he thinks he is. So we hear Paul this morning. Paul from Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 19. Hear now the word of God. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live this way will not inherit the kingdom of God. But, you know, sometimes but is a, is a word that you can comfort yourself in. And this is one of those places. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things as these, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, <clears throat> let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. This morning I want to remind you, reminding someone of something is a good office. We forget, at least I forget. My wife always tells me something and then when she asks me a question in response,
And I look at her like, you said what? Reminding ourselves is important because if you don't, somebody else will. God's longing for every Christian believer is that they should become more and more like Jesus. Let me say that again. God's longing for every Christian believer is that they should become more and more like Jesus. From all eternity past, through all the ages that are to come, the Father's will that you and I should be conformed to the image of his Son is God's will for us. Paul's language here is indeed decisive, direct address. And we all, Paul says, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Transformed into His image with ever increasing glory. Have you ever imagined what ever increasing glory must be like? I mean, the glory just keeps growing and growing and growing and becoming clearer and clearer and clearer as we look into the face of the Son of God and know that He is our Savior. He is the one who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. And He is in the process of transforming us into the image of his son. The key to what Paul is telling us here is learning to understand the metaphor Paul uses. You like that word metaphor? I do. I'm not exactly sure why, but metaphors tend to be things that draw us in further and further in. And it's hard to say, I fully understand what Paul means by this metaphor. But you can understand some of it. And the more you understand some of it, the increasing glory will continue to be an overflowing experience in your life. You know what fruit is. We had a nice little orange. Fruit is a natural part of the reproductive process for plants and stuff. I say and stuff because I don't know a lot about biology. But let's just say and stuff. Fruit is the natural product, not of dying, but of living, of life itself. Fruit takes time to develop. Character takes a lifetime. Did you catch that? Fruit is a natural product of life. If a tree is alive, it will bear fruit. Fruit takes time to develop. You don't plant a tree and then wake up the next day and expect to find fruit. But character takes even more time. In fact, character takes a lifetime. Dear friends, the Apostle John says, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him 
as he is. I like that. There are some things we don't know what we shall be. But there are some things we do know. That we shall be like him. Because we shall see him face to face. Here are some of the characteristic qualities that the Holy Spirit will produce like fruit in your life as he lives within you. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The kind of life described in these words of, Paul, of Paul's is not a matter of law keeping. This kind of Christ-like character does not come from submitting to a code of laws, but from submitting to a person. Christ Jesus our Lord. By submitting to him, the Holy Spirit works within us to be more and more like him. This way of living flows from the person you are becoming. Did you know that you are not a static entity? You're not like a block of wood. You are a living human being. And because you are a living human being created in the image of God, Christ's likeness can flow from you as the fruit of the Spirit matures and ripens in you. You like fruit. We heard the answer to that. Some of them like it. Some of them, eh, it's okay. But there's a big difference between ripened fruit, over ripened fruit, and fruit that isn't ripe at all. You ever grab an orange or not an orange, an apple? And, then, and bit into it and thought to yourself, this thing isn't right. It's not ready. It's not ready. The word fruit that Paul uses here has a surprise in store for you who understand it. For you see, here Paul uses a singular noun to describe fruit. Where one would expect to find a plural noun, we find in Paul a singular noun. The fruit of the Spirit are singular, not plural. The fruit of the Spirit are not meant to be treated as a menu from which you can pick a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit here. The fruit of the Spirit are a character package. Unlike the gifts of the Spirit, which are distributed by the Spirit to the body of Christ, to the people of God. The fruit of the Spirit grows all together within a Christian's life. All the pieces of the one fruit working together in unity, strengthening each other. Sounds a little bit like living in community, doesn't it? Aren't, haven't we told each other for, since the mid-1970s that one of the aspects of the Church of Jesus Christ is that we 
are together in this. It is not simply one against another. It is we are all in this together. We are living in community. And suddenly the metaphor of fruit that Paul has been using from the beginning of this fifth chapter begins to fade because Paul wants the congregation in Galatia to understand the world in which they live and why these particular fruit of the Spirit are essential for the life of the people of God. If you don't have these or this fruit, then the church will die. And the people of God and the message of salvation will become dim. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, Paul writes, The acts of the sinful flesh are obvious. Do you think that's true? I mean, is it really true that sinful flesh, we as human beings at our very worst, are easily recognizable. We live in an age when we have been taught from the time we were in school that it's, that, you know, right and wrong is a matter of opinion. What you like, what someone else likes. And here Paul is about ready to describe the character of the age in which he lives. And he is saying to you, listen, look. Because if you don't listen and you don't look, you're going to be deceived. Because sinful flesh is at war with the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God at war with sinful flesh. This is not neutral ground that we are standing on, my friends. This is blood-bought ground. Our Lord Jesus died and rose again, so we could declare this ground as holy ground. Let me sketch that for you. The acts of sinful flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, rich witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. That and the like is to tell you that I could make the list longer, but I'm not. You got it, right? What Paul says is that people whose lives are characterized by sinfulness, sinful flesh, they will not what? Inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Is for those who have bowed their knee before a risen Savior who is willing to wipe away every sin from your heart. Again, this is our strong words of Paul's. Paul writes in the past tense because he wants the Christians in Galatia to understand that having crucified sinful flesh is an act that every Christian is engaged in. We must engage ourselves in crucifying that which is contrary to
to the person and Savior of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You died, Paul says. You crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now walk in the Spirit. There are things that you must say no to, and there are other things that you must say yes to. Once God has redeemed you by his grace and taught you to begin to walk in the Spirit, the struggle will begin. It is for freedom, Paul says, that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of sinful flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Friends, there are things we should not do. That, does that sound like so elementary? That do we really have to bring it up? But in our age, we have to hold on to that truth with both hands. There are words that should not pass our lips. There are relationships we should not play around with. There are things a Christian should not look at. There are relationships one should not play around with. I said that already. There are desires we should not give in to. There are attitudes toward others we should not hold. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Here Paul combines a statement with a command, and we're almost done. He tells us a truth about ourselves, and then tells us and the implication for what we should do. Since we live by the Spirit, by the Spirit let us march. Did that word surprise you? It should have surprised you. I w when I first read Galatians, I, I was unprepared for that word march. We used to have a little children's song that uh, Christian youth crusaders used to sing. We are crusaders living for our king. We are so happy as we march along and sing. Marching. At this moment, at the very moment when God is taking up residence in your life through the presence of his Holy Spirit, we start to become the kind of people who bear the fruit of the Spirit. The word is in your mouth, Paul says, and in your heart, so that you may obey it. Jesus calls us to be doers of the word and not hearers of the word. The very ground that we are standing on needs to be cultivated so that it can be at its full, fullest best. It's funny how easily we claim to love the Bible without the life, loving the life it teaches. Yet nothing commends the gospel more powerfully than a transformed life. For the sake of the gospel of Christ, I ask you this morning to recommit yourselves to prove your love for God's word by believing and obeying it. Listen 
There is no biblical life without biblical living. There is no biblical life without biblical living. There's a little song in your bulletin. I asked Tommy if we could include it in our worship this morning. He's going to play it and sing it and then we're going to sing it with him. I want you to take a moment and just look at this prayer because it is a prayer. Look at it. Lord, make me like you. Please make me like you. You are a servant. Make me one too. O oh Lord, I am willing. Do what you must do to make me like you, Lord. Just make me like you.